Hello, and thank you for joining us for tonight's community meeting with Los Alamos National Laboratory Director Tom Mason and Ted Weika, Manager of the National Nuclear Security Administration's Los Alamos Field Office. I'm Lexi Petronas with the Labs Communications Team, and I'll be your moderator this evening. Tom Mason has been Director of the Laboratory since 2018. Before that, he was the Director of Oak Ridge National Laboratory for 10 years. Ted Weika is manager of NNSA's Los Alamos field office. He is responsible for executive leadership and oversight of the multi-billion dollar Los Alamos National Laboratory management and operating contract and all federal activities on the site. The pair joins us this evening to provide an update to the community about the lab's work, science research, economic impact, and much more. Tom and Ted will also take questions, which you've been sending in over the last few days. If you have a question you'd like to send in tonight, please email us. The address is asklanl at lanl.gov. But first, let's check in with Tom and Ted for an update. Thanks, Lexi. Um, Ted and I are just going to go through a very quick update on what's been going on at the lab and also with NMSA. Uh, really to kind of tee things up for the questions, which I think will be the meat of our discussion. And we'll be posting these view graphs online along with the recording of the meeting if people want to take a look at them afterwards. So it's certainly true right now that perhaps uh, more than any time since the height of the Cold War, um, the importance of our mission at Los Alamos has been really highlighted with the geopolitical tensions we see around the world, Ukraine obviously, Russia, China, uh, our, our people are helping ensure the reliability of the deterrent that serves as the ultimate guarantor of our security. Also detecting weapons of mass destruction, and we do that by advancing the frontiers of science, engineering, computing. Uh, we're also very engaged in prioritizing the transition to clean energy. Uh, which is another example of tackling an existential threat, in this case, climate change. Uh, we've been establishing a roadmap for net zero by 2050, working on uh, options for pollution-free electricity, reducing emissions, net zero facilities, both in terms of the laboratory operations and also in terms of technologies that enable society's transition and working across our region. We're fortunate that we've had bipartisan support in Congress, uh, for a number of years now, our budgets have been growing in response to the geopolitical situation and the demands of the country. And with that budget growth, we've been hiring. Uh, we've been awarding lots of contracts, and the hiring and procurement are really at historic levels as we work to meet those national needs. If you go to the next few graph, you'll see some of that. And with that hiring, uh, there's a strong focus at the moment at really making sure that we're an employer of choice. We've grown quite a bit. We're up over 15,000 employees now. And in fiscal year 2022, which for us ended at the end of September, we hired uh, around 2,100, actually 2,077 new employees. And 60% of those employees came from the state of New Mexico. Uh, we pay good salaries. The average starting salary at the lab is $103,000. We've also been making investments in our employees in terms of the benefits that we provided. In fact, in FY22, we enhanced our benefits by about $100 million. Uh, we've tried to enhance and improve the flexibility of paid time off. We've been responding uh, to very competitive labor market with appropriate increases in compensation. And we've been improving our benefits programs with fully paid disability insurance, longer maternity and parental leave, and better matches for the 401k uh, retirement program. We're also working to help increase childcare capacity uh, as many of our new employees are in the mode of growing families and looking for improved and increased options for childcare. So a lot of what we're undertaking at the moment is really about building capacity so that we can respond to the growth that we've seen in budgets and the tasks that are on our plate. So in addition to the recruiting and retention that I talked a little bit about, there's a large effort in site modernization, uh, and that takes many forms, but a lot of it is work that we do uh, not directly uh, through the lab, but through contracts, contracts for uh, facility construction and refurbishment. And we awarded $2.1 billion in procurements last year, which is up from the year prior, about $200 million. Uh, and 
this includes things like a new waste facility that's underway, badge office, modular office buildings, which is a very cost-effective and rapid way to increase the amount of space that we have. Uh, one of the things that we've been really focused on is uh, communicating to staff that how we do our work is every bit as important as what we do. I think most of the people who work at Los Alamos take a lot of pride in our mission, but we also take pride in how we accomplishment, accomplish it. We've seen significant improvements in safety performance. Our injury rates are well below state averages. Uh, they're categorized in different ways, but uh, the, uh, the numbers that you can sort of track through state statistics and national statistics include the uh, recordable injury rate and the uh, days away or restricted uh, injury rates. And you can see in comparison to the state of New Mexico, we are well below the state averages in both categories. Uh, we're about one third the state average in terms of the days away restricted uh, category, which is the more serious injuries. Um, we want to continue to improve our injury rates. Our goal ultimately is to have zero work-related injuries so that everyone goes home at the end of the day in the same shape that they arrived at. And although we're very proud of the fact that we're certainly doing well uh, when you look at those industry benchmarks, uh, we still have a lot of work to do to get to zero. Another concern is the housing and transportation that goes with this increased employment. And we've been focusing on that, although in those cases, those are things that the lab itself doesn't directly do. Uh, we haven't been building housing since the uh, Second World War when the Army Corps of Engineers was building barracks. Uh, we rely on the surrounding communities and the developers that are, that are building housing. Uh, and similarly for transportation, obviously transportation infrastructure is responsibility of state and local governments, but we're trying to encourage things like, uh, uh, you know, doing uh, van pools. There's a state program that we've joined uh, so that people can share the rides, reduce the number of cars on the road. We're also launching a pilot for park and ride bus system that will take employees from a, uh, a secured parking location in Powaki directly to our TA55 site where we're doing a lot of work to enhance the inf infrastructure for a plutonium facility. And I'm encouraged that the developer community in Los Alamos County and in Santa Fe and surrounding communities has been responding to some of the housing needs. Uh, just in Los Alamos County alone, there are about 370 units under construction and that takes a lot of work. Uh, we've been talking about the growth for a number of years and, and there's a pipeline to get new housing underway, but we're starting to see the results of that similar story in Santa Fe. Uh, really critical for our success are our partnerships and pipelines. Uh, we, we're working with our local communities uh, to try and encourage the sort of educational programs that will allow uh, students who are graduating opportunities to work at the lab. Uh, we're a big driver for job creation and economic development across northern New Mexico. Uh, the recent economic impact study uh, showed that the lab creates about 24,000 direct and indirect jobs in the state. Um, we paid gross receipts tax last year. It was $136 million. Uh, we spent $915 million on contracts with New Mexico businesses in FY22. And around 600 million of that was with New Mexico small businesses. Uh, the, uh, one, of the, so one of the things we've been exploring recently is expanding our footprint beyond Los Alamos County with leased facilities that can serve as gateways to the educational community and the business community. In fact, we're recording uh, this town hall discussion from one of those facilities in Santa Fe uh, on Pacheco Street. Uh, we've also been expanding with new facilities in Española that helps us address some of those capacity needs I talked about uh, and also reduce some of the burdens on commuting uh, since in many cases uh, that we have employees who are living in those communities and they don't have as far to drive to come to work. Uh, we also work with our partners at Sandia National Lab through the New Mexico Small Business Assistance Program and we've, we've been supporting the Regional Development Corporation to expand opportunities for economic development. So these uh, pipelines and partnerships are really key to us to meet our recruiting needs. Uh, I've been very encouraged by the response we've had from the educational institutions who've really helped us build some of those educational programs in, in some of those special skills that are really hard to recruit to uh, and make sure that we can find the workforce we need in our region. 
In terms of the R&D that's really at the heart of what we do, we're addressing challenges regionally, nationally, even internationally. Uh, we have some new supercomputers that are on the way. Crossroads will be uh, delivered uh, later this year. We've already begun taking delivery of the initial test cabinets and it's looking uh, incredibly promising in terms of its performance. And we're really excited about a machine we're calling Venado that's going to be pushing the envelope in terms of new and novel technology that may represent the future of high performance computing. Uh, and that'll have an impact well beyond laboratory missions uh, since high performance computing is really core to a lot of 21st century science and engineering. Um, we're co-leading something called the Quantum Science Center with other national labs, with industry, or with universities. It's a partnership to accelerate the design of novel quantum technologies. Um, we're engaged in something called the iWest Initiative with regional partners. Uh, this is looking at place-based solutions for energy transitions in the Intermountain West, and we're working hard uh, to move that to a phase two with the Department of Energy. Um, one of the roles that we play in our nuclear nonproliferation programs is developing systems that are payloads on the GPS satellites to detect nuclear detonations should they occur anywhere in the world. Unfortunately, right now, there's a lot of interest in that because of the situation in Ukraine. And recently, we were recognized for the support that the lab has provided with the Department of Energy Secretary's Honor Award uh, with uh, other labs and, and the department itself. Uh, there's been a lot of hard work behind the scenes to ensure that the U.S. government has the best possible information to understand what's been going on in the Ukraine. I'm now going to turn things over to my partner, Ted Weika, who leads the uh, NNSA Los Alamos field office. Uh, and he's going to talk a little bit about some of the initiatives that we're working on together. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, Lexi. Good evening. And uh, it's a really a pleasure participating in this public town hall meeting, and definitely a, a pleasure engaging with the public and look forward to your uh, questions and answers. And, and this is super important. This public outreach is stakeholder engagement. In fact, we have another event in a couple of weeks, a community uh, conversation, uh, which will be a similar type form. And sort of a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been here going on about two years now, uh, and the time has really flown fast. It's a, it's a super exciting place and especially exciting time. Uh, we're really enjoying the community uh, and all aspects of the outdoors. I love skiing and uh, doing all the hiking and stuff that the, uh, that the environment offers. And I'm up here with my wife, uh, as well as we have a big old husky. Uh, we live on, uh, in Los Alamos, probably a couple of miles from the lab. Uh, so we're always uh, roaming the town and walking the Husky. The reason why I mention that is because safety, security, and environmental compliance is everything is a lot more than just my federally inherent responsibilities. It's also safety of family, safety of the community, and my ex expanded community down here in Santa Fe. Uh, you know, some of my federal inherent uh, responsibilities is approving all the safety bases documents for all of our nuclear operations, as well as approving the startup of those operations. And we work that goes very closely with our lab partners uh, and environmental compliance and everything we do in the, being a good steward of the environment. Again, again, a very good partnership. You know, Tom talked a little bit about some of the critical national security uh, missions that we have, and we'll get a little, probably a little bit more in as we go along into the questions and the answers. But those are very important, uh, very high priority with the department. And I think we have a budget to support that. Uh, you know, and it's very important, for, you know, in terms of the safe and secure and effective nuclear deterrence. So everything we do, you know, uh, falls into those categories. Uh, um, in fact, we had a visit here by the deputy secretary as well as the administrator last week, you know, and they took the time to look at, you know, a lot of those critical missions that we're doing. Uh, let me discuss a couple points before we get to the Q's and A's though. Uh, one is in the area of stakeholder engagement. You know, that is uh, critical in everything we do. Uh, being as transparent as possible in all of our mission type activities. We have a lot of uh, 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 public par uh, participation in the site-wide environmental impact statement, which is underway. You'll probably, uh, uh, you'll probably see a first draft in the summer time frame. And that's going to be an opportunity to do public meetings uh, and engage with the public on comments, you know, as well as we have another environmental assessment on another transmission line. 
We have the surplus plutonium disposition. So in the area of uh, uh, the National Environment Policy Act is a, a great forum to continue that public engagement about everything we do up here. But there's also a, a lot of other things that we do in terms of uh, not only these public forums, but engagement with the Pueblos and the tribal nations, uh, the state regulators, uh, EPA, uh, and, and you know, so it's all about communicating uh, in transparency. And really, our, the success of our mission depends upon that. It depends upon you know, that active communication with you, the public. Uh, the other area is waste management, you know, which is again critical to, uh, to our national, cr uh, critical on national security missions. It's getting the uh, waste off uh, the, from Los Alamos down to the waste isolation pilot project. Uh, and we've done a lot of great work in that as a partnership, not only with the lab, but with the uh, uh, EMLA and environmental management, as well as Carlsbad, uh, to you know get sh uh, waste off the hill. And, and in fact, we uh, 1,250 drums were shipped just in fiscal year 22, which is a phenomenal increase. Uh, the other area is, you know, the, the extensive work on fire mitigation, especially as we get into fire season. That's really prevalent. You know, and uh, the success that we had last year was actually based on the work that was done several years prior to even getting the last year. And that's the fire, the wildland fire mitigation efforts, you know, done at the lab to make sure that, you know, a lot of the cleared wood and combustible loading is cleared out. Uh, and that was done, you know, extensively and it really helped uh, during the last fire season. Uh, the other key thing is just that communication. You know, not only with the uh, with the county and with the state, but we had several federal agencies that we were also communicating. And as we get into fire season again, you know, that was just a major success from last year. Again, it was a lot of communication and active uh, discussions with the public. Uh, and back over to you, Lexi. That's thank you. Thank you both so much for those updates. Uh, it's time now to take questions from our surrounding community members. Remember, if, you, if you'd like to ask a question this evening, email us at asklanel at lanel.gov. We'll get through as many questions as we can until 7 o'clock. So this is a great, a great question to start off with. Uh, this one is for Ted. The question reads, it's not really clear to me how LANL, NNSA, DOE, and N3B are different. What are your different roles and why are there four different entities there? That's, that's a good question and it is somewhat confusing because there are a lot of different components of us, but we're all really one department. We have the same mission. It's our national, critical national security missions. We have a different role in those missions. Uh, you know, our, uh, my colleagues in environmental management, they're responsible for the cleanup of legacy waste, which they do very well, uh, environmental compliance, and, and their contractor is N3B. Uh, and they work closely together to make that happen and made a lot of progress over the last several years. Uh, and and w my, our responsibility are the national security missions. Uh, and, and again, we can't do that without working with environmental management. And, and my job is to oversee the contract and to approve safety bases and uh, nuclear operations. But it's really that partnership between the lab and the federal government to get to our, uh, to, our, to our mission successes. It's not just, you know, environmental management and N3B, and like I mentioned before, it's, you know, uh, Carl's Bad Field Office and their MNO uh, support, con the MNO contractor as well. And it's, it's, you know, we all have our own responsibilities, but it's, you know, getting the critical mission done. Uh, yeah, but so it, it's really that partnership. There's really no daylight between us in, in our critical missions. It's just our unique aspects and the roles that we have. Great. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the reasons it's maybe not that well understood is because the Department of Energy is a little bit unique in the U.S. government in the extent to which it makes use of these management and operating contracts. There are other government agencies that have them. Everyone's probably familiar with the Jet Propulsion Lab which is a NASA uh, contract. Um, and that goes back to the Manhattan Project when General Groves was charged with very quickly responding to that national crisis. He wanted to mobilize US industry and academia to tackle that problem. Uh, and so the original Los Alamos contract was held by uh, the University of California. And uh, in a certain sense, in the modern world, maybe you could think of Ted as General Groves, and you know, maybe I'm Robert Oppenheimer. Those are kind of big shoes to fill, but those are the roles that we play. 
Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, here's another similar question for our audience, and this is also for both of you. Um, and this is the question. Although I do not understand it exactly, you no longer have responsibility to, prote to protect the environment at the lab. That is a different company. Do you feel any responsibility to protect those of us living around the lab? Yeah, actually, I would say it's, in fact, not correct to say that we don't have a responsibility for protecting the environment. We absolutely have a responsibility for protecting the environment. Uh, the difference is the environmental management program and the environmental management contractor are responsible for the legacy environmental issues that go back to the Cold War and even to the Second World War. They have very well defined set of responsibilities to clean up the legacy waste. That's what they're expert at. That's what they're focused on. Our environmental responsibility is associated with the ongoing operations at the lab and making sure that the missions we execute don't harm the environment and the surrounding communities or the, the people who work and live uh, in the area. Um, so that's a, that's a concern that we take very, very seriously, but there's a definite uh, division of responsibility in terms of legacy waste versus responsibility for current activities. I'd like to, you know, actually weigh in on that as well. And, and, and Tom's absolutely correct. Uh, it's in all of our job descriptions, you know, environmental compliance and complying with the regu uh, environmental regulatory regulations and being good stewards. You know, uh, our in environmental management colleagues, like Tom said, has you know a specific role on the legacy weights. But everything we do, all 14,000 of Tom's employees, all of my employees, as well as environmental management. It's all about you know, complying with the safety requirements, security requirements, as well as environmental uh, regulations. So we all have a role no matter what we do in, in environmental compliance. Great, thank you so much. Um, we have two questions related to our important mission and current events, so I'm gonna ask them back to back. The first is, last week Russia backed out of the new START nuclear arms treaty. What does this mean for the lab's efforts trying to monitor and counter the spread of nuclear weapons? Yeah, so I mean, probably the first thing to emphasize is, you know, as a lab, we have a responsibility to, um, you know, respond to the technical needs, the policy needs of the nation. We obviously don't negotiate treaties or, or set policies in these areas. But in our non nuclear nonproliferation programs, we develop technologies that allow us to verify compliance with treaties. Uh, and uh, the, that's a very important element of treaties. Uh, the famous quote, I think it was President Reagan, who said, trust but verify. Um, and those treaties have provisions for verification that allow for inspections. Um, the announcement, recent announcement by Russia, uh, was actually simply a statement of what has been the situation for a while, which is they are no longer uh, willing to allow those inspections that are provided for in the New START Treaty. Um, that does make the job more challenging of, of verifying compliance, but that's one of the roles that the labs play is developing technologies for verifying compliance with treaties with uh, partners who are cooperative. Uh, and in the event that there are partners who are not cooperative, we have a responsibility to try and understand what's going on by other means, which are usually called national technical means. Uh, and so, uh, we have to figure out what's going on. It's obviously easier and enabled when there are treaties and compliance with those treaties, but that responsibility still exists even, even when, uh, in this case, uh, the treaty partner declines to participate in those activities. And I agree, you know, the non-nuclear proliferation is still a cornerstone of our mission. It's very critical. And we work, work, continue to work with our global security partners, you know, to detect and detract, and, you know, nuclear materials. A lot of work with the atomic energy, um, uh, energy agents, atomic energy ag agency as well. And and it's it's our, we we have a critical uh, role in the arms control uh, world, and and we will continue to do that, you know, despite what Russia does. Great. Uh, here's the second of those current events questions. Uh, I think we are antagonizing Russia and China into starting a new nuclear weapons race, and the lab and NNSA are complicit in that. Why aren't you doing more to reduce the number of nuclear weapons instead of building more pits? Well, I think, you know, one thing that may be behind this question is there's perhaps a little bit of a misconception as to why we have to build new pits. It's not driven by a need to expand 
uh, the number of nuclear weapons that we have. The reason that we're having to reconstitute the capability to build new pits is to actually maintain the level of nuclear weapons that we have. Um, and uh, the um, current plan that we're working on, in fact, the, the pits that we're making will go into the Sentinel system, which is a replacement for the Minuteman missiles. Uh, so we'll be taking old pits and turning them into new pits, but it's not a program that's based on growing the nuclear arsenal. It's simply sustaining it. In fact, the policy of the U.S., which the lab is tasked with executing, has been what's called stockpile stewardship, which is sustaining the arsenal, uh, not expanding it, uh, not taking steps that might be seen as provocative. Um, un unfortunately, uh, other countries have kind of taken a different, maybe more expansive view, uh, so they haven't necessarily responded uh, to our show of restraint, but th that's really uh, what's, what's underway now, is, is just seeking to sustain the deterrent that we have which is actually very much smaller than it was at the height of the Cold War. Uh, there's about 10 times fewer nuclear weapons than there were. So there have been very substantial reductions. Um, I think that's one reason why it's unfortunate that the um, Russians have announced the suspension of the New START Treaty because it's through those treaty agreements that many of those reductions occurred. And I agree, you know, the U.S. government has done a lot to reduce the number of nuclear weapons, but the ones that we have have to be effective and reliable. And the lab is a, does a great job with others in, you know, making that happen as a design agent and a production agency. And, and it's, you know, it's an insurance policy. We need to have, uh, you know, weapons that work. It's, 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 it's our core mission, you know, within the Department of Energy and the NSA. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about our important mission by diving into this next question, which focuses on the lab's pit production. Tom and Ted, this is a question from Jay Coughlin for both of you. The Department of Energy has a long history of loan budgets involving tens of billions of taxpayers' dollars. As a matter of good governance, what effort has the lab undertaken to ensure credible and complete cost estimates and an integrated master schedule for expanded pit production, both of which GAO strongly recommends? Well, probably the most important recent step was in January, actually, we received approval uh, for what's called Critical Decision 2 and Critical Decision 3. Uh, those, uh, that represents the development of a detailed, what's called baseline, uh, for something called LAP4, the Los Alamos Plutonium Pit Production Project, that's four Ps. Um, and the LAP4 base, as it's called, was baselined. Uh, and that means we do have those detailed schedules, detailed cost estimates for that portion of the project. Earlier in 22, we actually baselined the first phase of that project, which is called D&D, the, the demolition and decontamination of the legacy uh, equipment that will be removed from the PF4 facility to make way for the new equipment that will be coming on, under LAP4 base. So until you have that baseline, uh, you, you don't have a detailed cost and schedule. Um, and uh, so, you know, I think that was what GAO was recognizing. The important thing is we do, now do have that for those two very important components. Uh, the LAP4 base represents a $1.8 billion investment on, on the part of NNSA to advance that mission. Um, we also have developed an integrated plan between the operation of the facility and the installation of the new equipment. And that's something we're working on very intensely now because we recognize that there are some opportunities to actually improve the schedule through close coordination of those efforts and, and uh, you know, really uh, fa time phasing things in a way where for periods of time we can have dedicated access for that equipment installation, which is so critical to getting to the end of that project on time and on budget. Yeah, I mentioned Jay has a good question, and the GAO did a good review, and that is an enterprise-wide uh, issue that we're dealing with, uh, and we're wor and we're working it. Uh, we're working as an enterprise, trying to uh, see where we can gain efficiency. We're doing some pretty uh, good here in some of the LAP uh, uh, Lab Four projects, but you know, across the enterprise, we need to gain efficiencies on how we manage and execute projects. Uh, a lot of that is just the processes and the reviews that we're doing. We're looking at that. Are they all value added? As well as the number of projects that we have going on at the same time. Do we need to start in uh, you know, all of the projects at the same time or do we need to pace them a little bit better? 
Great. Uh, Tom, you mentioned in your presentation that the lab brings certain benefits to the state of New Mexico. So here's a question that comes back to that. I heard that there was a report a few years ago that showed the lab has almost no net economic benefit for the state, but I just saw a story on TV about the lab's economic contributions. Does the lab benefit the state of New Mexico or not? Well, I think if you look at the just the last year, you can see pretty good uh, example of the sort of benefits that we provide. Um, you know, we have about 15,000 people working at the lab every day. Uh, we pay uh, good wages with good benefits and people in those jobs buy homes, shop in stores, eat in restaurants. And, and so that, that uh, is a direct infusion of about one and a half billion dollars of payroll into the economy of northern New Mexico. Then you add to that the procurements that we make, and I mentioned uh, I think that we do a lot of work with small business, about $600 million of procurements with New Mexico small businesses, and that's out of nine, or over $900 million of procurements with New Mexico businesses large and small. And of course those companies employ people who live and work in the state, uh, shop in the stores, eat in the restaurants, and, and take advantage of the wonderful cultural amenities. Uh, so if you, if you look at the economic footprint associated with Los Alamos, we are the largest employer and the largest uh, sort of contractor to other companies in, in the whole region in northern New Mexico, and that has a huge impact uh, on the economy. Um, we also pay taxes. We pay New Mexico gross, gross receipts tax, uh, $136 million last year, and that's money for the state and local governments to uh, you know, provide the educational system that, that uh, equips people to take on jobs like those we have at the lab, the transportation infrastructure that allows them uh, to get to work, and facilitates you know, the housing developments where they can live. Um, so that's a pretty significant economic impact, and it's not just a flash in the pan, you know, one and done. We've been here for 80 years as of 1943 to 2023. And the investments that we're making now will ensure that we have a long-term future in the state. Great. Um, well, we're talking economics already, and actually, GRT, here's a question about that. How much did Lano pay in GRT to the state of New Mexico last year, and who decides how it gets divided up? Well, as I said, we paid $136 million in gross receipts tax, highest it's ever been. Um, as a taxpayer, you don't get to decide. Uh, how, the, how the government uses those resources other than, you know, we all have one vote and it's the elected officials who make those decisions. Um, and uh, that's something that's determined, you know, by the state government. And then of course there's a local portion. Uh, certainly my hope would be that uh, the uh, state and local governments are focused on those three things that I mentioned, the quality educational system so that uh, our employees can have good places to send their kids to school and we can have future employees who have the skills that we need, the transportation infrastructure, and facilitating the uh, development of good places for people to live. But I don't get to set those priorities. Those are set by state and local government. Sure. Uh, so the next question focuses a bit on our workforce. And as someone who was born and raised in New Mexico, I'm also interested in your answer to this. Uh, this is a great question for you, Tom. How many people do you employ from New Mexico? It seems like you should be trying to help our students get good jobs at the lab rather than hiring from out of state. Well, if you look at the last year, 60% of the roughly 2,100 new employees came from New Mexico. Um, historically, if you look at the current uh, sort of laboratory population that was hired over many, many years, it's about 40%. Um, and the reason I think that um, we're seeing an increased number of new employees come from the state is because we're working at it. In fact, it's one of the things that I have heard many, many times when I talk to uh, elected officials at the federal, at the state, at the local level, uh, what can you do to hire more New Mexicans? And I think one of the reasons we've been successful in that is because of the tremendous partnerships that we've been able to develop with the local educational institutions. Uh, talking with them about the skills needs we have, and then uh, allowing them to use that input to develop programs that, that address those skill needs, whether it's Northern New Mexico College, UNM Los Alamos, Santa Fe Community College. Um, it's, it's, it's made a big difference. Um, big advantages for us 
in that you know there's a housing crunch right now and if we hire someone locally they may already have a place to live uh, and the other thing is I think it really helps us in terms of retention if you if you grew up here if you've got roots here you're less likely to pull up stakes and go somewhere else so uh, there's a lot of good reasons for us to be working on this and we're going to continue to do that I could just sort of add to that too because it's just not, not just a job fair is that we're doing obviously you know the lab is going to be around for the next many many decades and requiring a lot of different job skills you know from the engineer and the scientist to the crafts maintenance construction trades and it's all about also getting to the the youth early <laughs> into into the you know uh, junior high schools high schools to let them know about the opportunities up here that they could have a 30 year career and change jobs every you know four or five years and do something exciting so it's a lot of the outreach that the lab uh, is also doing to you know help with that job pull uh, sure. into the future okay. uh, speaking sort of of pipelines um, can you tell us of all the people who are taking jobs who of all the people who are taking jobs with us, can you tell us what areas they're living in, such as Santa Fe yeah, or yeah, Los yeah. Alamos? Or so uh, about 40% of our staff live in Los Alamos County, so that's Los Alamos and White Rock. Uh, that means 60% of the lab staff actually have to commute to Los Alamos from uh, off the hill. Uh, about 20%, and these are just round numbers, it changes a bit from year to year, but about 20% from Rio Arriba County. Uh, and 20% uh, from Santa Fe County. And then the, the other two big ones are, are Sandoval County and Bernalillo County. Um, and then people will commute over a large distance. We have people further afield even than those immediate surrounding counties. And actually we have a number of employees uh, down uh, supporting the WIT facility in the Carlsbad area. Uh, but really, the, the, the main ones are, are uh, Los Alamos County, Rio Arriba County, and Santa Fe. And then uh, increasing numbers from a little further away as we've been having to grow the workforce, particularly with the construction workforce. I think over 45% of the construction workforce comes from more than 50 miles away. Uh, and so that's just showing, you know, how how big a pool of people we're having to tap into in, in response to the increased demands of our mission. Excellent. Um, so another topic that comes up fairly regularly when we talk about our workforce is housing, which you mentioned a bit earlier, but this question presses on that a bit. There's a housing shortage in northern New Mexico and all the hiring the lab is going to do is only making it worse. Why can't the lab build housing for employees? Well, we did in the 40s, but I'm not sure that people want to live in barracks in 2023. Uh, so that's really something that we look to the surrounding communities and the developers for. We have been talking about our plans for hiring really for several years now. And actually, we're starting to see the impacts of that. It does take a long time to get these projects through the pipeline. There's a lot of hard work that has to go on to find the right land and deal with zoning and permitting and of course water is always a challenge in our region but i'm actually quite encouraged by the level of activity as i think i mentioned in the in the slides there's about 370 new units under construction in los alamos county alone and that is a lot given you know the constraints on on land in the area they're looking at really creative ways to redevelop some sites that have been underused and you know build a little higher density which i think will be attractive for some of the new employers that we're hiring, uh, and also maybe for some retirees who are looking to downsize. There's also a fair amount of activity in Santa Fe, particularly on the south side of Santa Fe. And in speaking with some of the developers, it looks like some of those um, developments, about 40% of the people moving in are, are working for the lab. I think there's discussions going on in Rio Arriba County to try and identify, unlock some of the potential there in terms of development, uh, which is a challenge because they have a lot of uh, land that, that isn't developable because it's federal lands or it's, it's tribal lands. And even some of the tribal communities have some options that they will be looking at as well. So it does take a while, uh, but I'm encouraged that there's a, a, a lot underway. Um, but there's no question that there is, there is a crunch. Uh, and we've seen this nationwide. You know, one of the reasons that I think we're facing a nationwide housing challenge is we haven't been building enough houses. Um, as, as a country and uh, you know that's a simple supply and demand thing and certainly we're feeling it here in New Mexico. 
If I could just add to that as well, because this is a long-term issue that we're going to have to deal with. Uh, and so uh, there's the issue of building houses here up uh, in Los Alamos, and we're working with county on different land transfer opportunities. But it's the economic development around the Pohaki Quarter as well, which Tom mentioned we're engaged with the uh, regional governors to look at you know, not only transportation and parking and maybe a little bit of warehousing, but also, you know, apartments. But the, the issue is also, you know, what, uh, you know, Tom is sort of leading is the teleworking. You know, we have this wonderful facil facility that we're in, which can hold several hundred working in different uh, off times, as well as the Pacheco building, uh, the Guadalupe. So it's, you know, using teleworking in a smart manner to keep people, you know, necessarily not in Los Alamos. Yeah, I think, for example, the Santa Fe footprint that we have now really does make a difference because um, it, it reduces the traffic on the redu roads, reduces the environmental impact associated with that commuting, and it's much more practical for people coming up from, from the Albuquerque area, from places like Rio Rancho and so forth, to come up to Santa Fe is much more kind of reasonable commute than, than trying to get all the way to Los Alamos. And then when you mix that in with the telework, uh, you know, that can help as well in terms of being able to... Um, you know, draw from a larger footprint without having everyone have to shoulder the burdens of really long commutes. Sure. And uh, your answers there bring up another topic that this next question addresses, which is infrastructure. Here's the question. A few years ago, Tom, you talked about five-year five and ten-year plans for infrastructure at the lab. Would you please tell us if there are any changes to those plans and if they'll ever be released? Well, in fact, we did uh, release uh, the, the work product that came from doing a really uh, site-wide comprehensive plan. Uh, it's a living document, so in some sense it's, it's always changing as we finish facilities and we can kind of take them off the wish list and as new needs emerge. So we're, we're, we're always kind of updating and refreshing it. It's actually an electronic system uh, that uses a geographic information system so that we can really plan in a thoughtful way. It will be actually a uh, very useful impact input to the site-wide environmental impact statement that Ted mentioned that NMSA will be doing because this really lays out uh, what our plans are for the site over both the near term, the medium term, and the long term. Now obviously all that's dependent on federal budgets and the budgets are appropriated year to year. So that's another reason why we have to update the plans is you know we have to look at what gets funded and gets taken off the list and, and what maybe has to slip out because it, it doesn't receive funding in the first instance. So living, breathing document. That's a good document and you know, that is our campus master plan. Yeah. And, and what's the, what we'll even need to do is even look at, expand that and campus master plan is things that we have more control over, but there's also the regional plan, which involves the transportation, the roads, uh, you know, the bridges and, and the housing, and, and we have less control over that, but that'll stuff what we'll have to engage in discussions, you know, as, as we're with the mission that we have in front of us. Great. Um, Ted, here's a question for you. There are a lot of important archaeological sites on lab property, especially ones that are important to the indigenous peoples of northern New Mexico. Are archaeological sites open for public tours, or can you share pictures of them by any chance? Good question. Uh, you know, that's an area that you know I take very uh, is very important to me. It's really critical, and I spend a lot of time uh, in discussions with you know the Accord governors, but other governors re, uh, and uh, tribal nations as well. We have 23 in in New Mexico, especially our Accord uh, governors, which are re, uh, our neighbors. You know, these are sensitive, very sensitive areas, and you know we're, we have a stewardship to protect those. And so those are things that we do not open to the public. We do not have pictures of. We do not do tours uh, because it's all about preserving those sacred areas. And we work closely with the governors in everything we do. For example, the third transmission line that we're bringing up to Los Alamos. We're engaging in, in the Pueblos, uh, hiring some of the uh, representatives as uh, archaeological and, and construction consultants to look at those sacred areas as, as we're developing our, our transmission line. So everything we do and, uh, you know, we, we take in consideration that, you know, this is, you know, land that was previously owned by other Pueblos in San Adafonso, and that's a sacred trust that we hold with them to preserve that. And the lab itself, we actually have 
an archaeology group. Uh, and they work very closely as we're planning new facilities, trying to site new facilities, or even as we're undertaking operations, uh, you know, Ted made mention of the wildfire mitigation work. And one of the things we have to do is make sure that when we're doing the final wildfire mitigation that we don't damage any of those sites. So we have expert staff who, you know, know where those locations are so that they can make sure that we protect them. Um, but, you know, if, if you're interested in visiting sites, I suggest Bandelier National Monument is the place mm. you should be going. <laughs> Um, now, Tom, earlier you spoke about career opportunities at the lab, and this audience member set in a sent in a question looking for a bit of guidance. My son will graduate from high school this spring and wants to be a welder. Do you need welders, and if so, how can he apply? Yes, we absolutely need welders. That is definitely one of those critical skills. You know, there's a few areas where it's just really hard to find uh, people. Uh, electricians are also in, in high demand. Uh, we've been doing job fairs where we do on-the-spot job offers, so you can look for those. But actually, the easiest thing to remember is the website jobs.lanl.gov, uh, and you can go there and see the job listings that we have. We've also been working with area high schools and the New Mexico Building Trades uh, to develop a pipeline for apprenticeship programs. Uh, so there are a number of different ways, but the easiest one to remember is jobs.lanl.gov. Well, I have a couple of them, like the, the, question, uh, uh, the person with the question answered, also kids trying to get jobs. Uh, but this is a, a fabulous opportunity up here because it's, you know, it's, it, the entire gamut of occupations are available, from security to crafts, construction, maintenance, trades, all the safety function areas, as well as engineering and scientists and chemists. So it's whatever you're into, there's, there's, a, you know, there's an opportunity up here at the, in the lab to participate. Yeah, people may think that it's really only for scientists or physicists, and that's, that's really not the case. For a site as large and complex as Los Alamos, we need pretty much every imaginable skill. Um, to be honest, we don't have a lot of jobs for people who have no skills. Uh, but we've got the pipeline programs to make sure that people can develop the skills that we need and get those jobs. Right, great. Um, now, you spoke a little bit, a little about this earlier when talking about the economic benefits the lab brings to New Mexico, and I, um, let's see, the asker of this question is looking for a, more, a few more details. What is the lab doing to help small businesses here in New Mexico? Uh, well, the the biggest thing that we're doing is awarding a lot of contracts to small businesses, as I said, over $600 million. Um, and it is absolutely critical for us in getting our mission done to be able to tap into that expertise. Um, we, we love working with small business because they can develop the understanding of our mission and you know, specialized skills or capabilities to meet those mission needs. And, and because they're you know, usually local, uh, they're very, very responsive, and, and um, we've got aggressive goals in contracting with small business, and, and we've been doing a lot of outreach to that, that community to try and develop more vendors. Um, so um, it's something that, that is, that is uh, absolutely critical for our success. Great. Well, this next question brings up the discussion to transuranic waste, also known as true waste. What's the status of the lab's true waste operations? Well, as, uh, as I think we talked a little bit about, the laboratory has responsibility for the newly generated waste, not the, not the legacy waste. And, and our job in particular for true waste is to make sure that we are you know, properly dispositioning that, which actually generally means uh, getting it down to the WIP facility in Carlsbad. And since we resumed shipments to WIP in 2019, we went from one shipment a week to two shipment a week, shipments a week to three shipments a week to now even sometimes four shipments a week. So what that means is uh, we're actually now getting rid of waste faster than we are producing it, which is where we need to be. Uh, we had built up a backlog because as those shipments had been suspended for a while, so we are now working that down uh, and, and we need to sustain that tempo. And in fact, at the same time that we've been accelerating the shipments, we've also been increasing our operations, but we are staying ahead of that with the pace of shipments that we have, and we need to make sure that continues to be the case. Yeah, I'd like to add to that. This is a, you know, a, a 
reconfigure its success over the last couple of years. Uh, it's very critical to our national security mission in our pit production. We can't really effectively do that without having a good waste management program in place. And it did not happen by accident. It's, it's really a partnership between the federal agencies here, Carlsbad Field Office, EMLA, myself, as well as the M respective MNOs working together as a team to gain efficiencies in the process. And that's where we were able to get from one shipment uh, a week where it was sort of a highlight to uh, four shipments uh, you know, a week where it's you know, just typical normal way of doing business. Uh, and it's that partnership that was able to, to sort of make that happen. It's also being good environmental stewards, you know, getting the waste into its best uh, location uh, you know, that it could possibly be in. And I think that you know you probably saw the number that was cited in the slides, but it was 1,249 drums last year, and that's just the Los Alamos National Lab shipments. That does not include the legacy waste shipments that that uh, N3B and the Environmental Management Program are responsible for. Uh, one of the things that we've been able to do is actually coordinate our shipments with theirs, uh, so that we can make more effective use of those shipments by putting you know drums from both sites on the same shipment because that's a very, very precious resource. Uh, WIP is a really precious resource and we have to make very effective use of it. Okay. Great. Tom, it, it would be great if you answered this next question. Uh, for the last few months, I've been hearing explosions and feeling my house shake. I hear that's because the lab is doing underground weapons testing. Is that true? Well, I think what may be referred to as actually underground nuclear tests, which is not something that we do. In fact, it's not something that the U.S. does. That hasn't been, it's actually not that long ago we celebrated the 30th anniversary of the end of uh, uh, underground testing. And part of our job as a lab is to make sure we have the scientific tools so that it's not necessary to test um, in order to certify the safety and the effectiveness of our nuclear deterrent. And so we have a lot of scientific tools and, and, and measurements and computers that we use to carry out that task. Um, and actually as part of that, we do do small scale experiments just with high explosives to understand their performance. Also to develop new high explosives that are more environmentally friendly and don't use some of the nasty materials of the older processes. And so we, we, we have firing sites at the lab where we do those tests. Um, we do carefully try and understand the size of the explosion and the atmospheric conditions so that we can kind of minimize uh, the impact, but they can sometimes be heard in the surrounding communities. Um, in fact, that's one reason why we need a kind of standoff distance uh, from the community, why, uh, you know, some of the land that might be a beautiful location for housing probably is not appropriate, uh, sometimes because of those archaeological artifacts, but sometimes because of the fact that we, you know, do uh, take advantage of the unique nature and remote nature of some of our site uh, to do those tests. Uh, but they are not underground nuclear tests. And I'd like to add, and that's a very important mission that we do at the lab is, you know, the firing sites and the, H and the high explosive work, you know, especially as our mission is increasing. And we have really good discussions with the county because that is a discussion of maintaining those good standoff distances to prevent, you know, impact on homes. Great. Uh, here's a question that came from, from Scott Kovac. And he asks, uh, the, the fiscal year 23 NNSA budget request shows four new buildings at Lanel that are planned to support pit production. Uh, facility construction estimate, so plutonium engineering support building, 48.7 million. Plutonium program accounting building, 48.7 million. Plutonium mission safety and quality building, 48.5 million. And plutonium production building, 48.5 million. Uh, the question is, what are the odds that four buildings would end up costing nearly the exact same amount? Please explain the advantage of three of these estimates all being under $50 million. Well, it's actually not a coincidence that they are all essentially the exactly the same amount because what we're trying to do is uh, use a standardized design of what's called modular construction. This is something we've done at a smaller scale already with some smaller office buildings, and, and we found that they're very cost effective uh, and, they're, and they're fast. Um, and so um, that standardization is part of what will save us money and, and, and get them built. And, and uh, 
uh, I think the very, very small differences in the cost estimates is because there's a time phasing, so uh, there's a slight difference there. But other than that, they really are identical facilities, and that's why the estimates are, are all the same. If I can add, this is where we can get Jay and Scott talking with each other, because Jay had the question about some of our inefficiencies and in projects. This is actually something that we're doing enterprise-wide around NNSA, is doing projects differently. Like Tom said, modular projects using different standards and constructing them. Uh, and we've actually had success in building things like fire stations and normal office buildings, and these are sort of similar type facilities that we can easily build you know, uh, using efficiencies and the practices and the uh, procedures that we use. Not everything is a one-of-a-kind nuclear facility, right. thankfully. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, Tom, can you answer this next question? It's from Greg Mello. Here it is. Uh, what is the specific value to the nation of the pits? The lab hopes to, hopes to make between the second half of fiscal year 24, when the first war reserve pit is to be made at Lanel and the start of pit production at the Savannah River site. As Ms. Ruby said, two weeks ago, SRS is expected to be able to make more than 50 pits per year. Yeah, so the current plan is for two sites, Los Alamos and Savannah River, to meet a military requirement of a minimum of 80 pits per year. And that uh, corresponds to 30 pits per year, minimum of 30 pits per year from Los Alamos, minimum of 50 pits per year at Savannah River. We are able to start production sooner here at Los Alamos because we have an already operating facility. In fact, we're making pits now, uh, not so-called war reserve pits, but we're testing out and proving out the processes that will, will be used to make those pits. Uh, we made five in the first quarter of this year, and since then we've made another two, and there's a third one kind of on the way. Um, and that's to compared with seven in all of the previous fiscal year. So we're, we're ramping up the production, and once we achieve that so-called first production unit in 2024, the subsequent pits will also meet the qualification and certification requirements to go into the Sentinel system that the Air Force is developing to replace the aging Minuteman system. So the, you know, to get specifically to the question, the pits that are built at Los Alamos starting in 2024 will be going into Sentinel mm -hmm. and they'll be meeting part of that need. The full need will be met through a combination of Los Alamos production and Savannah River production. Um, but at the moment, we have the only location that can do that work and it's gonna take a while longer to get Savannah River online. And just as Ed, it's not a tell of two sites, it's actually a system, it's a team. Uh, you know, Los Alamos remains the plutonium uh, center of excellence in, the, in all the research and as the design agent, it's working in partnership in the production activities you know, with the 30 pits we do here as well as the 80 or the 50 that they'll do at Savannah River. Great. Uh, we've tackled some serious questions here today, so here's a little, little lighter question. What's your favorite part about living in northern New Mexico? Uh, well, some of what uh, Ted already mentioned. I mean, this is a great location in terms of the outdoor activities, uh, you know, skiing, cycling. Uh, I live in Santa Fe, not in Los Alamos, and, and I enjoy the fact that Santa Fe is an amazing town, particularly given its size. It really punches above its weight in terms of the cultural amenities and the restaurants and those sort of things. Uh, so I think, you know, there's a lot to offer in northern New Mexico, and it's it's one of the things we tell our prospective employees, whether they're people from the region who may already know they don't want to go anywhere else or someone that we're trying to attract from outside. I have to add too, you know, not only everything Tom said, but it got me away from DC. You know, I was in DC <laughs> a few years, so you know, coming out here in the great outdoors with the ski and you're only you know, living up there in Los Alamos, you're 15 minutes away from your driveway to being in a ski lift. Uh, yeah. So it's a wonderful, wonderful area, and then in the summer with the hiking and the rafting down, you know, down near Taos, and just a beautiful community, wonderful people, great restaurants. All it's the chili, all the chili you can eat. All the chili you can eat, plus <laughs> this is a place to be. Great. Um, this is actually our final question, and it looks like we have uh, just time for this last one. So it's for both of you, both Tom and Ted. This town hall is great but we would like more opportunities to talk to NNSA and the lab to understand what's happening on site at the lab. Uh, are you going to make yourselves more available to the public? 
Well, certainly, I think, you know, the town halls have been a recent thing that we started doing and have been very useful. It's great to, you know, have all the engagement with the questions and a chance to answer them. Um, and we'll also be posting a recording of this online so that people who didn't have the opportunity to participate live will be able to see it. And we're going to continue to do these. Um, we have other ways that we engage. We've been doing what we call community conversations, meeting with community leaders. Uh, we actually hosted a, a, a breakfast for the legislature when it was uh, in, in session uh, to talk to the uh, state officials. Um, we've been doing a lot of uh, job fairs and recruiting. I've been talking to uh, school boards because education is so important to what we do. So we're trying to do as many different sorts of things to kind of complement some of the more formal stakeholder consultations that maybe Ted might talk about that are also an important element of how we engage. Exactly right. You know, this type of forum is super, uh, really critically important. Uh, you know, and, and like Tom said, we're going to be doing a community converse conversation, you know, in a couple of weeks. Probably should do more of these, uh, it, we, but we do a lot. Uh, you know, especially with the uh, uh, Pueblos and the uh, tribal nations. You know, I meet on a monthly basis with the Accord governors and we're going to have a Accord, a semi-annual type discussion, Tom and I as well as EM and N3B, uh, you know, with the Accord governors and, and with various communication mechanisms with the other 23 tribal nations as well. A lot of outreach to the state regulators and the other federal agencies like EPA, both Region 6 as well as headquarters, uh, a lot of engagement. Probably a key part is also the environmental impact statements. You know, uh, you know it, it's, it is a big deal because when I first got here, I noticed the last, last EIS we did was in 2008. And that's really a mechanism to talk about our mission. Uh, you know, all the defense work that we do and all the environmental impacts associated with that. And so that's going to be happening over the next couple of years. And we have, again, uh, one on the uh, third transmission line as well as the surplus plutonium disposition. So there's going to be a lot of outreach, a lot of opportunities to engage with, with the community, uh, you know, on what we do. And, and I work closely with my counterpart in EM. Uh, he does it probably a little bit more in terms of on the environmental and uh, waste cleanup. You know, with, with respect of our mission, the best way to communicate is through our environmental impact statements and the public forums that we're going to have associated with that. Okay, great. Well, thanks to you both for being here tonight, for filling those questions. And uh, at this community meeting, we are just about, we are out of time. Thanks so much for being here. As Tom mentioned, we will post a recording of tonight's session on our website, so be sure to visit lanl.gov in the coming days to see the recording. Thank you to our fellow community partners for participating tonight in continuing this important open dialogue. And thank you to the hardworking crew for helping us put this meeting together. On behalf of the laboratory, thank you for being here, and good night. Good night.